Good morning, Team Alabama. We are ready for page 178, if you can find it on your book, in your book as well. We're in mid-page 178, Countdown. The space age and the television age were coming into their own at the, time, at the same time. NASA understood that they were making history and that the events taking place should be broadcast to the world and recorded for history. The agency sent a film crew to each of the tracking stations, recording the communication teams as they completed their pre-flight checkouts. The footage showed the second-by-second -second drama in mission control as white men in white shirts and black ties faced long desks with communication consoles. Headphones on, serious expressions on their face, the men stared up at the enormous electronic map of the world on the wall in front of them. There's a picture on the top of that page, page 179. Because of her close working relationship with the pioneers of the space task group, it was Katherine Johnson who found herself in a position to make the most immediate contribution to the Mercury mission. When the phone call came in to Katherine Johnson's office at Langley, she was sitting at her desk. She overheard the call with the engineer who picked up. She knew she was the girl being discussed in the phone conversation. Astronaut John Glenn didn't know her name, but she was the one he was talking about when he wanted someone to double check the numbers. Catherine knew the numbers he meant, the ones that described the trajectories of an orbital mission around Earth, just like her first research report, the one that she had worked on with the engineer Ted Skopinski. In the final section of the report, Catherine had calculated by hand two different sample orbits, plugging numbers into the equation in the report, and then she compared the results to the results from the IBM electronic computer, which had been programmed to calculate the same equations. At the time, it turned out that there was very good agreement between IBM's output and Catherine's calculations. Catherine and the machine got the same numbers. This work double checking the electronic computer was a dress rehearsal for the work that was now required. Checking the numbers not for a sample orbit, but a real mission with an astronaut on board. Confidence. Though Katherine Johnson didn't usually panic in stressful situations, she was very nervous about the task in front of her, but she was confident in her math skills. So she organized herself at her desk. Thick stacks of data sheets and trajectory equations surrounded her workspace. Instead of generating numbers and sending them to be checked by the computer, Katherine worked in reverse. She took the data from the computer and ran it through her own calculations. She wanted to see very good agreement between her numbers and those generated by the computer. Catherine worked through every minute of a three orbit mission. It took a day and a half of watching the numbers pile up until she had completed the task. When she delivered the data sheets to the Project Mercury engineer, she had no doubt that her numbers were correct. February 20th, 1962. February 20th, 1962 dawned bright and clear and 135 million people tuned in to watch the launch unfold on live television. Katherine Johnson sat in the office breathlessly watching the news coverage. At 9.47 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Atlas rocket boosted Friendship 7 into orbit. Ground control cleared John Glenn for seven orbits around Earth. During the first orbit, the capsule's automatic control system began to act up, causing the capsule to pull back and forth like a badly aligned car. Glenn smoothed it out by switching the system to manual and acting as if he were flying a plane. At the end of the second orbit, a warning light indicated that the heat shield was loose. A heat shield is the outer covering on the spacecraft that protects it from extreme heat when the craft re-enters Earth's atmosphere. So it makes sure you don't burn up. Without the firewall, there was nothing standing between Glenn and the 3,000 degree temperatures, almost as hot as the surface of the sun, that would build up around the capsule as it passed back into Earth's atmosphere. Mission Control had a solution at the end of the third orbit. orbit. After the retro rockets fired, Glenn was to keep the rocket pack attached 
to the spacecraft instead of getting rid of it as was standard procedure. The NASA engineers hoped that the rocket would keep the loose sh heat shield in place. At four hours and 33 minutes into the flight, the rockets fired. John Glenn adjusted the capsule to the correct position and waited. The spaceship slowed down and pulled out of its orbit, heading down, and at that point, the most dangerous part of the re-entry, the signals flickered and then went silent. There was no signal from Friendship 7. The engineers tried to figure out what had gone wrong, but there was nothing Mission Control, control could do. Silence. One minute passed. What are they thinking? They're worried that the worst has happened. Then two. Three. Everyone feared the worst, that the heat shield had failed and the spacecraft had been burned. The team struggled to reconnect with the spacecraft. Ten minutes passed. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen minutes after the si signal silence, John Glenn's voice returned. He was alive. The spaceship continued its descent with the computer predicting a perfect landing. When Friendship 7 splashed down, it was off target by just 40 miles, and that minor error was only because the estimated weight of the capsule de during re-entry included the added weight of the rocket that had remained in place. The computers, both electronic and human, had worked flawlessly. 21 minutes after landing, astronaut John Glenn was safely out of the water. John Glenn was a hero. He had an audience with the president, a ticker tape parade in New York, and from Maine to Moscow, large newspaper headlines cheering him. The African-American press cheered him. All of us are happy to call him our ace of space, wrote an African-American columnist in the Pittsburgh Courier. Nowhere was the hero's welcome as warm as in Hampton Roads, Virginia. 30,000 local residents turned out in mid-March to celebrate the man they considered their hometown hero. Glenn rode in a lead vehicle of a 50-car parade that included the Mercury astronauts and their families. The 22-mile route went through Hampton and Newport News. The parade ended at a stadium where Glenn stood behind a podium with a sign reading, Space Town, USA. The city of Hampton changed its official seal to depict a crab holding a mercury capsule in its claw and it adopted the motto e preteritus futura out of the past the future john glenn wasn't the only one being cheered word of katherine johnson's role in the mission made the rounds in the african-american community on march the 10th 1962 a photograph of katherine johnson was featured on the front page of the pittsburgh courier the caption read her name in case you haven't already guessed it is katherine johnson mother, wife, career woman. The article recounted Catherine's contributions to the work that sent Glenn's rocket through the sky. Johnson attended the, home, the Hampton Parade, allowing herself just a moment of pride, having been part of such an accomplishment. She didn't stay too long. She wanted to recognize the hard work and success of the team but there was nothing more exhilarating for her than getting back to work on the next assignment. Okay, Team Alabama, we are going to stop there for today. Please write a few more facts if you need them to get to your 50. Have a great rest of your day.